Good day chaps. So today's video will be on the Chimera tank destroyer. In this instance the 1984 project undertaken by the Long Armour Infantry Course. And if you want to know more about the Long Armour Infantry Course I recommend you check out our Nemesis video. But what's important to take away from this is that unlike the earlier SDT projects, many of the Long Armour Course programs were first and foremost a design exercise only and not part of any official British tank building program. Nevertheless, ideas gained on new theories would be shelved should a requirement for a similar set of criteria be raised. Today they serve a secondary purpose as they demonstrate the fashions and trends of the time and when looked at as a collective whole you can see theories on what was popular at the time and how officers from different parts of the world had similar ideas despite no previous connections. So on to the vehicle itself, the Chimera 1984, and I use the date as there are several Chimeras, as both the STT and Long Armour courses had a habit of reusing names. The team consisted of officers from various nations. The project lead was from the German Armoured Corps. There were officers from the Royal Tank Regiment, some Aussies from the Royal Australian Armoured Corps, as well as some Canadian officers, and a Dane from the Jutland Dragoons Regiment. So a bit of a mixed bag and they would be supported by a large number of industry specialists and the MOD to test and evaluate their ideas. After attending all the previous requirements and subcourses, they were given the following task. Given that there will be an urgent need to give infantry an effective tank killing capability, the call for standardization of equipment within NATO and the merits of collaborative equipment development, design a tank destroyer for the use in the mid-1990s. So the team had to design a tank destroyer for the use by the UK and other NATO partners and ideally use parts in common with those countries. To this end, a few choices were readily apparent. Notably, reworking the older Chieftain hulls, which were getting replaced with Challenger, or fitting anti-tank guided missiles to the Warrior platform. It was decided to repurpose Chieftain, as this would be the cheapest option, be relatively simple, still have surplus parts, and they felt it to be reliable, although I question that last part. The vehicle itself would have its turret removed and the hull turned into a spat or self-propelled anti-tank gun and the role of tank destroyer applied. This conversion would also give greater customer options such as the choice between 120mm rifled and smoothbore guns as well as optics and engines. The team looked at tactical deployment issues they felt that as tanks were often used as part of an all-arms battle group, that some would be have to be used in defensive situations. However, while effective, they were not efficient. A tank in a defensive role is not utilising its mobility or offensive capabilities in an optimum role, while a tank destroyer with a fixed gun they felt would be better suited, and that it could use conventional kinetic energy attacks, it would supplement the lighter weapons used by infantry which generally have shape charge attacks. This they felt would free up tanks to be used offensively while providing the infantry in defensive roles with an effective counter. These tank destroyers would thus work closely with infantry defending objectives freeing the tanks for other purposes, but also be able to support infantry in advances with covering fire. Any machine designed would need to be able to kill enemy main battle tanks have sufficient protection to survive long enough to reduce the Soviet numerical advantage and the mobility to redeploy or follow up afterwards. Therefore the priorities were firepower, then protection and finally mobility. The team looked at different layouts as well. These included a guided weapon system on the MICV-80 or Warrior chassis and this has been studied a lot elsewhere. How it was felt that while it offered promises the net result would not be cheaper and the overall cost of developing and operating such a machine would be as expensive as those of a main battle tank. Then there was the external gun options on Warriors, and again this has been studied elsewhere. The UK has invested a lot of time in looking at external guns. These offer the benefit of a smaller silhouette and crew safety features. However again there were problems. Firstly that in order to increase the protection required, the mobility advantages of the hull would suffer. The 120mm gun required would also need a new recoil system to be designed as well as a muzzle brake, autoloader 
and single-piece ammunition for external use, all of which would chew up R&D costs and be less favourable on export markets. The last option was the casemated type. This they felt offered the best solution, but came with its own problems. The profile was lower and it was cheaper, reusing the hull saved money, and previous work done could be looked into. Weight was saved and they were easier to armour, yet there were inherent problems with this type of layout. Firstly, there was the issue of how to fit the gun. This needs an aperture wide enough to traverse left and right, but leave enough internal space for the gun breech to traverse and recoil, and of course not have too wide an opening, which is problematic in fording and for NBC issues. However, just making the vehicle wider is not a solution, as it still has to fit the standard NATO rail gauge. The opening issue was solved by using a large ball mount, the same as used on tanks like Tortoise, which gave the vehicle 533 mils of traverse left or right, or 29.9 degrees of traverse either side, which, when tracking a tank moving at 30 km an hour at 1 km distance, gave 65 seconds of tracking time. This would then be mounted on a simple artillery style gun mount inside. But there was also the crew aspect. In many casemated designs, the vehicle's traverse is hindered by the crew, particularly with the driver located towards the front. Three positions were thus explored. A driver front, driver back centre, driver rear and offset. The first was discounted, the second provided good rear views for reversing, while the last provided the best median solution. And the fact that many sight systems were to be digital and not linked optical systems allowed a bit more wiggle room. The crew were three men, the commander, a driver gunner and a driver loader and in a similar system to the S-Tank would allow the gunner or driver to switch roles in an emergency. Both the gunner and commander are situated to the left and right hand side of the breach and all three crew would be in a seated position which was done to keep the height as low as possible. The gun itself was to be the XL30 which became the L30 fitted to Challenger 2 and was to have 46 or 48 rounds of standard with 30 hash and 14 armour piercing fin stabilising discarding sabo and two smoke listed as standard. Although the numbers do vary a bit between the pages, and a later image shows the ammunition in circular drums for 63 sections, although this could have been for graphical purposes only. The vehicle's gun depression was at minus 8 degrees and an elevation of 12 degrees, which is not ideal, but in casemated tanks, the larger the gun, the less depression is possible. The team also states that fighting a Rhine metal smoothbore would be very easy if required. Secondary protection was in the form of a 7.62mm Hughes chain gun fitted above the commander's sight. Chimera would have a full fire control system, laser sight and assisted aiming system built into it. The commander had all round vision and all the crew were to have day and night thermal sights with an emergency backup telescope if needed. For protection the Chimera was very heavily armoured for its time with twice the protection of most main battle tanks. The main block to the front was 610mm of Chobham armour, angled back at 20 degrees for 700mm effective armour. Below this it was 122mm at 89 degrees for 702mm of steel, and above it on the upper hull front the same type of plate and thickness. The lower nose, like many British tanks of the period, remains relatively thin at 110mm angled back at 34 degrees for 132mm effective thickness. However, unlike conventional tanks, this vehicle would in theory spend more time in pre-prepared emplacements where this could be hidden. This added a lot of weight to the front, and so an extra road wheel is added for seven in total. The midsection had a 100mm bulkhead separating the crew from the ammunition drums, and the rear of the vehicle is balanced by the engine. The hull sides are well armoured as well with 310mm of steel running alongside the upper hull over a 40mm backing plate for 350mm, while the rear upper hull sides are just 40mm and the entirety of the lower hull 40mm. However, the bazooka plates to the side were also 100mm thick. The rear and back plates are 25mm while the belly is 20 in all steel. Secondary protection also came in the form of VERS, or Visual and Infrared Screening Smoke Launcher, with a pair to the front, 
a full MBC setup, and the ability to carry ERA packs over the front and side to offer even more protection. Provide power for this chonky tank, the engine chosen was the CV12 Rolls-Royce engine, rated at 1000 brake horsepower. Transversely mounted and attached to a TN12 gearbox in a single unit designed for easy removal and access, but sharing commonality with parts in other British main battle tanks at the time. The engine bay was designed to be wide enough for potential buyers to fit their own engines if they wished. Power was then delivered through a rear sprocket to 14 pairs of rubber tyred road wheels, 7 per side, each with hydrogas suspension points and 3 return rollers. The tracks were for a simple dry pin steel type with optional rubber bushes. The top speed for the Chimera was estimated at 60 km an hour on the road and 35 km per hour off-road and a total weight of 53 tonnes. So that's Chimera in a nutshell. But was the concept any good? Well, some felt so, particularly the Canadians who took the project home and looked at it further. For the UK's perspective however, the answer was no. They had already undergone many evaluations in the previous future main battle tank years on the pros and cons of a casemated tank, albeit not as a tank destroyer. However, even with doctrinal differences, the loss of a third crewman would almost immediately cause such a design to fall at the first hurdle, as many a vehicle has hit that roadblock. Not only does it increase the crew's stress and stretch capability, but it severely interrupts the crew's hierarchy system. Today, the plans and manuals drawn can be found at the Bovington Tank Museum, along with one of the surviving models, albeit incorrectly marked as an S-Tank concept. Well guys, that's it for this video. If you did like this, give it a like or a thumbs up or a share or whatever. And until next time, toodle pip.